Welcome back. After the gruelling business of reviewing the first five games, we aren't exactly left with much to show. A series with an uncertain future, and a protagonist that's presumably deceased. After four roller coaster years, well, Lara had to take a bit of a break from the digital world. But the success of the series was hardly going to be ignored, everyone else wanted their little piece of the pie. Lara Croft first appeared outside of games in 1999 with her own successful series of comics. Now I know absolutely nothing about comics so I can't exactly tell you much about them, but I know that it was just the beginning. Because virtually the second Lara became popular, the whispers started about a Tomb Raider movie. What with the game's somewhat cinematic nature and the big surroundings and all that, how could there not be a film? And indeed, the wheels were set in motion pretty soonish, in spite of the fact that movies based on video games, even at that point, weren't exactly regarded as a surefire winner. Now, you might forgive me for this, I hope, but I rarely get a chance to talk about film at all, so forgive me for a little sidetrack. A brief history of movies based on video games up to this point. It's kinda simple, actually. Absolutely no one had the faintest clue what to do. Before Tomb Raider, every video game movie had been basically an unmitigated flop, although granted there hadn't been all that many. Super Mario Bros. is one of the films that shows the main problems, just how little there is to work with. Cause you know, what have you got? A plumber's trying to save a princess, and uh, that's kind of it. There's virtually no characterisation to speak of or anything, meaning your average filmmakers basically flying without a safety net, ultimately forced to pretty much make shit up. Mario Brothers just about stretched to a fondly remembered 80s kids show, but there wasn't anywhere near enough for a movie. And the end result, you know, is kind of surreal. A couple of hours of people just clearly brainstorming, panicking, throwing shit at walls, hoping they'll please the kids. And of course they didn't. The various fighting game movies worked perhaps a little better, although not by much. They could at least rely on action a bit more, as well as having a few more characters to choose from. Street Fighter was, in all honesty, perhaps as noble an effort as it could possibly be given the materials on hand, whether that was a virtually non-existent plot or an impossibly wooden John claude Van Dimme. Not from behind the curtain, wizard. Let's see how pure your combat really is. The whole thing is just ridiculously silly, but fun to watch all the same, at least for a bit, and it only lasts about eight minutes, so you know. But still, there are only so many fight scenes you can do before things do get a bit boring and empty. It is, at the least, still well remembered for Wow Jr.'s performance as M. Bison. As hammy as it may be, it's a tour de force, a great actor going beyond the call of duty just to make the film memorable, if the stories are true purely for the sake of his kit. And hey, as a kid I loved Street Fighter, and I think that was pretty much entirely because of Julia's performance as Bison. Vaya con Dios, well, and may you rest in peace. The day Bison graced your village was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. And then of course there's Mortal Kombat. Now truth be told I didn't like this one nearly as much, although nowadays I can say it's a better movie than Street Fighter. It's pretty much the same deal, with a wafer thin plot that simply tries to cram in as many characters as it possibly can, but it marshals them a little bit better. There's nothing that's even slightly as memorable as M. Bison, not even Shang Tsung. Your brother's soul is mine. But it's much more balanced. And hey, balance is good for fighting, is it not? The action's also a lot better too. It appealed to martial arts movie fans and the like. It didn't even flop all that hard and managed to get a sequel. Even if Mortal Kombat Annihilation ended up being a total abomination and perhaps the worst movie mentioned so far. Still, you know, Mortal Kombat, not a bad try. I've got to go. Done. I'll give me a break. Okay. But, on the whole, the time for video game movies hadn't come yet. In the end, Hollywood decided they'd wait a little while for games to become bigger and more cinematic so they could be, you know, ripped off easier. And in the early 2000s, that time came. With a big action resurgence courtesy of films like The Matrix, 2001 and 2002 saw the release of tons more video game movies. There was Tomb Raider, Final Fantasy Spirits Within, Resident Evil, uh, House of the Dead, and various others to come. 
They were a bit more successful at the box office this time around to boot, although the films were pretty damn far from perfect, believe me. And thankfully, the first Tomb Raider movie highlights a whole bunch of the problems, some familiar, some new. Stop! Now, development of Tomb Raider the movie can be traced back to around about 1998, when in fact various people who had already been involved in video game movies tried to get their slice of the pie. Brent Friedman, co-writer of Mortal Kombat Annihilation, of all films, wrote an unproduced script in 1998. Stephen E. D'Souza, director of Street Fighter and various other films besides, also produced an early draft of what would eventually become the film. Of course. In the end, though, the film was produced by your typical Hollywood types, with the director's chair taken by Simon West, man behind Con Air and The General's Daughter. Yeah, me neither. Of course, the big question on everyone's lips was, who was going to be Lara Croft? You might have thought of the original Lara Croft girls like Rona Mitchell and whatnot, but they were mere rumours. Eventually, the role went to someone who at the time was one of Hollywood's breakthrough stars, Angelina Jolie. Jolie at this point had mostly done serious dramatic roles. There was the cult film Hackers, her head turn in lead role in Gia, and her fantastic show stealing turn in Girl Interrupted, which she won an Oscar for. She'd also already earned something of a reputation as a uh, kind of odd. You know, having a little blood bond with Billy Bob Thornton will do that for you. And she wasn't above Hollywood fluff either. Her first role after winning Oscar was in the pointless and crap remake of Gone in 60 Seconds with Nicolas Cage. Terrible, yes, but it made a few bob, and it set Jolie up to become huge. And in 2001, Lara Croft Tomb Raider would be her vehicle. Right, so let's get on with this. First off, uh, what's the plot? Well, it's something to do with planetary alignment, I think. Uh, the Illuminati want to take control of the Triangle of Light, which will, if the two halves are joined together when all the planets align, a 5,000 year event that fortunately is scheduled to take place next Tuesday, will give the Holder the power of God to go back and forth through space and time. Yeah, yeah, insert your Doctor Who references here, because I'm not gonna. You come here prepared to fight a madman, and instead you found a god? Lara, Lady of Croft Manor, unmotivated by the dull, pointless jobs in places like the pyramids and whatnot, discovers this in the bowels of her mansion. Her father originally took on the task of stopping the Illuminati from getting hold of the triangle, but alas, he failed. Yeah, rip. And yes, Lara's father is played by John Voight, the real-life father of Angelina Jolie. He puts on a not-at-all-bad English accent, I have to say, although not quite as good as Jolie's. And so, there's your conflict, pretty much. Lara Croft in one corner, and the Illuminati in the other, represented by a dapper, slicked-back hair Scott named Powell. You know he's evil because he smokes small cigars. We see the world in all its glory. The Illuminati are based in Venice, one half of the triangles at Angkor Wat in Cambodia, and the other is in the deepest, darkest depths of Siberia. So yeah, this movie called Tomb Raider does actually feature some raiding of tombs in it, which is something of a step up from most video game movies up to this point. Now the best thing about the movie by far, by far far far, is Jolie's performance as Lara Croft. It's not a good movie at all, but she's certainly put in the effort in, and gets the character absolutely dead on, even if all that really means is moving like her, looking like her, and making the appropriate grunts in action scenes. And of course, you know, a lot of British sophistication that thankfully never feels faked. Jolie's performance is believable, and even if it's not exactly the strongest character in the world, it's very much good enough for what this is. You know, your average summer blockbuster fluff piece. It's a pretty damn good performance. Really? Fascinating. Ian Glenn's performance as Powell is uh, solid enough, I guess, you know, in a soap opera bastard of the hour type way. But the weak link is, oddly enough, uh, James Bond. Yes, uh, Daniel Craig has a role as Alex West, the Tomb Raider who sides with Powell and is in it for the money. And he proceeds to put on quite possibly the absolute worst American accent I have ever heard. Seriously, he sounds like he's trying to impersonate Mickey Rooney. Just listen for a moment. I want them all down. Take them, carry them across the ladders. Come on, guys, let's hustle. No, that's it, really. I've not dubbed him or anything. That is his actual accent. You know, it's quite perfectly awful. 
quite clear that this talentless moron never went on to do anything else ever. The only other film that exists of him is this one where he gets tortured a lot. So where does the movie fall down? Well, as you might expect, the plot is incredibly weak and will fall apart under even the slightest scrutiny, but it's a summer blockbuster and a video game movie, so you would expect that and perhaps be generous. Unfortunately, it's just pretty damn awful as an action movie. You get special effects that really haven't aged well, repetitive lazy wire foo that's nothing compared to, say, Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, Scenes that are supposed to be suspenseful and puzzling have all the intensity of an early afternoon game show. And of course there's all boring references to the video games and just boring scenes in general. Absolutely nothing sticks out compared to everything else that was around at the time. The movie's got nothing on, say, The Matrix or even, I don't know, fucking Swordfish. It's more like an extended episode of Relic Hunter. This is the really frustrating thing about Tomb Raider because it's so close and yet so utterly far away. It's got a good hero, a generally decent cast of characters, it's got every element that's needed but then it shits the bet. It never gets in close enough, there's never any suspense and, fatally for a movie like this, absolutely none of the action is even remotely exciting. And if the action's a shit show, then no matter what, the film's in trouble. You just wish that the movie had been made by someone like Tony Scott, instead of the British director you call when Tony Scott's not available. A lot of the lack of suspense does also unfortunately come with how perfect Lara is as a character. You never feel as though she's in any danger at all from these dweebs, meaning that one of the better things about the movie, her character, is sadly one of the things that also cripple it in a way. It is sort of fun, however, to watch Lara play with all the men in the film, most of whom are clearly obsessed with her to a dangerous level. Oh, keep in mind that Charlie's Angels was released around this time to boot, so you know, fits right in with that particular zeitgeist. But it's not in a boringly sassy way like that movie is, it's a bit more playful. You know, in the end I don't hate the film, but I can't say I like it and I certainly wouldn't repeat the hundred minutes I spent with it. It's just frustrating because with a better hand behind the camera, uh, it could have been so much better. And with all that said, you know, it's still one of the better adaptations of a video game out there, which kind of says a lot really. Critics at the time panned it largely for the same reasons I just did, but the film was still a success, making around $275 million worldwide. Jolie's performance as Lara was also praised by everyone as the best thing about the movie, and the box office numbers showed that she could clearly handle the picture on her own. And so obviously, there was going to be a sequel, Toot Sweet. <laughs> so yeah, you know, whatever. Obviously I'm going to watch that too. So let's sit right back down in the theatre chair again and watch Tomb Raider The Cradle of Life, released in 2003. Now at the very least, we definitely have a better director at the helm this time. We've got Jan de Bont. Uh, he directed Speed. And Speed 2. And the awful remake of The Haunting. But still, you know, Speed. I can cling on to that at least, can't I? So Cradle of Life's plot is pretty much the same thing, only this time it's all about Pandora's box. There's no Illuminati or anything like that, just an evil bastard who makes chemical weapons played by Julius Caesar out of Rome. So hey, the villain's got an upgrade, cause you know, Keewan Hines, great actor. You'll also see Gerard Butler as Lara's anti-hero companion, a small role for Jimon Honsu, and returns for Arnold Wimmer and his somehow nerdier friend I can't remember the name of. Heinz's character, Jonathan Weiss, wishes to find Pandora's box, sell it, and then let every other idiot open it and release the plague so he can sell the antidote to whoever's left alive. Piece of cake, huh? Now that's just about all you need to know. Any archaeological details are dispensed in favour of action, action and more action. Cradle of Life is a big, big dumb blockbuster, even more so than the first. And you know what, in actual fact, 
it's a better film for it. Not to say that it's any good, but I enjoyed it more. Simple fact is, Jan de Bont is a much better director of action than Simon West is. I never got the feeling that the guys behind the first two made a film knew what they were doing, but the second at least has a director with decent ideas when it comes to action sequences. Everything from the one-on-one -on -one fights to the shootouts and the big stunts are bigger and better, even though this film actually had a smaller budget. And they actually make for some decent intense scenes from time to time. Or at the very least a bit of eye candy. Having said that, you do still get some horrible CGI and some pretty shoddy editing in places actually. The bit near the end with the Shadow Guardians I find a little embarrassing to watch, I just don't think it makes any spatial sense if that makes any sense whatsoever. There's a bit too much obvious post-production stuff kicking around. The ideas aren't bad, but the execution, the attention to detail and the care is lacking a bit. That's the more techie stuff anyway. You'll also find an entire litany of huge gaping plot holes and characterisation that's about as minimal as drawing a stickman in the margins of your ethel pad. So you know, what the hell's new. And yeah, a lot of the action is kind of poorly done, but hey, I respect the ideas. I respect, you know, the work that went into creating it, and I would take that over a complete lack of anything at all. The highlight is, once again, Jolia's Quaffed. She's still good at it, still gets all the best lines in the movie, and still bounces everyone around like bunnies, forming and breaking partnerships like she's Maury freaking Povich. I'm not leaving because I couldn't kill you. I'm leaving because I could. It helps more this time that Jonathan Weiss is given a bit more body, and is certainly presented as a much bigger threat than Powell is from the first movie. I can't say I ever gave much of a fuck about Powell's intentions, whereas Weiss is clearly evil as all hell, a modern day Dr. Mengele as he's described in the movie. Jolie's character is certainly a bit more gung-ho this time around, and some aspects of her relationship with Sheridan, Butler's character, are kind of ridiculous, but hey, you can't help but root for her all the way through. And you know, even feel a bit of pathos at the end when Greed finally gets the better of Sheridan, and Lara has to shoot him. Sad, I know. What a shame. Mind you, she gets over it quickly enough, the two comic relief characters nearly get hooked up in a tribal ceremony, and after realising this they won for the sunset, all the way back to not Gayville. Cut and print, everybody. <laughs> To be honest, there really ain't a whole lot more left to say about these movies. I mean, this particular movie is big and stupid. I could nitpick my way through the plot holes and the like, or the lack of anything resembling a decent story or anything like that, but it would be missing the point. The fact that they exist at all is something you not necessarily accept, but you at least note down, because they do still stop the movie from actually approaching anywhere near half decent. I suppose either of you know how to fly a helicopter. That and it is somewhat bloated and overlong as well, a two hour stretch when 90 minutes would have suited everyone just fine. I can't help but wonder what on earth the point was of, say, the Chinese gang who steal the map to Pandora's box at the start and then just get played for idiots by everyone else immediately after. In the end though, it's a more entertaining watch than the first film, although not good and not recommended. Both of these films wear thin before they're done and they're certainly not something you'd remember. And it seemed like no one particularly wanted a second film either. Cradle of Life was not a huge flop, but it was a disappointment for Paramount. There were plans to make a third film, but they were scuppered by Jolie deciding that she didn't want to don the twin pistols again, and quite frankly without Angelina Jolie, there was going to be no point whatsoever in making another. So Paramount looked for someone to blame for Cradle of Life's failure, and guess who they found? Core Design. Yeah, that's right. We're going back to Gamesville. No, 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 not that game's feel, but God. Cradle of Life was released in conjunction with an unrelated but entirely new Tomb Raider game, the first for a couple of years. Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness. Now, obviously, Lara was never going to stay dead. You'd have to be fucking stupid if you believed that. In fact, development on it started while the regular Raider team was working on Chronicles. And of course, it was going to be on PlayStation 2, codenamed Tomb Raider Next Generation, and it was first unveiled at E3 in 2002, set to be out immediately. Except there wasn't really much to show but a few animations of a next generation Lara just running about a bit. But a playable opening level was then showcased in September by Core's head, Jeremy Heath Smith. 
Pooh, by all accounts, was swearing up a storm as he desperately tried to get Lara to climb on top of a bin. The alarm bells? They were winning. Everything that was shown to the public spoke of a game that was far from completion at best, and at worst was sticking its head straight down into development hell. Once Chronicles was finished, the old TR team came over and apparently found that the whole thing was a mess and basically had to be started from scratch. Flashy animations were indeed pleasant, as were endless ideas quipped from fellow top action games like Metal Gear Solid and Shenmue, but no one had given any thought as to how the player could actually control the animations, or how any of these ideas would fit together. Angel of Darkness looked like it was in trouble right from the off. However, it would rise to the surface, with the promise that it would be the first part of a new Lara Croft trilogy. It hit the shelves in June of 2003, a month or so before The Cradle of Life came out. And yeah, I think you know what's coming next. Let the bloodletting begin. Actually no, let's do some positive things first. Angel of Darkness actually does feature a bit more plot than what we've generally seen in the series so far. It kicks off with the death of Werner von Kroy, Lara's mentor, and everything pretty much spirals downhill from there. Of course, it's all kind of like the movies. Another artifact that will control the world, another guy that has to be stopped. It's all a bit grimmer this time, though. Whereas the first five games were generally a lot breezier, this is kind of dark. Lara herself gets a great deal more character than that of posh English woman who steals trinkets, at least. And although most of the voice acting is winsome and horrendous beyond belief, Janelle Elliott's performance as Lara isn't half bad at all. You can trust the environs are also miserable enough to have some atmosphere, although they don't have quite the charm of a PS1 title. But the best thing about the game by far, that I would absolutely recommend above anything else, is the music. Seriously, the music to this game is amazing. It's a Hollywood level score, and by a long distance the best music the series has ever had. Even if you don't play the game, you should seek the soundtrack out. But alas, I can't be all that positive because, well... This is just a tragic title. Despite all the delays of over a year or more, it came out rushed, blatantly unfinished, and hideously behind the times. The controls are the first problem. They're so irritating to deal with. Lara can now automatically vault over any railing she comes across. In theory, that's not a bad attempt at streamlining movement, but in practice, the one movement on a narrow walkway will lead to a stupid and unnecessary death. You have to hold a button to sprint now, and if you don't, then Lara's pace is so freaking inconsistent, she can't decide whether to walk, jog, or run. And this makes progress painfully slow at times, and I can't understand why Core would make this change at all. The combat has, if anything, gotten worse. The cumbersome, tank-like controls of Lara are now combined with a hand-to-hand -hand combat system that, quite frankly, would be bested by your average point-and-click adventure game. And you've also got a terrible camera, or at least a camera that tends to deviate to Resident Evil-esque cinematic angles, usually at the most inopportune times. The level design features largely the same puzzles we've all seen before, which isn't a major problem, but there's a new terrible mechanic where Lara has to level up in order to break down certain doors or turn certain wheels. This is ridiculous, and it makes no sense. I mean, remember this is Lara Croft we're talking about? The Queen of the Tombs? And all of a sudden she can't break down a freaking wooden I'm not door? Enough. It's a joke! One of the most blatant examples of artificially yeah, lengthening really a level I've ever seen. And the addition of stealth elements, required by law in every PS2 game made in 2003, is also a disaster. The controls are cumbersome, wall hugging is infuriating, and the enemies are imbecilic. But really, for a PlayStation 2 title, it's just so disappointing. It feels like a PS1 game. Lara's still moving around on a grid, the animations haven't changed all that much, and the gameplay's all the same. And this all worked fine, it worked absolutely fine back in the late 90s. But not in 2003. Just look at the competition. Prince of Persia Sands of Time was released in 03. Splinter Cell came out the year before. There were games like Ratchet and Clank, Beyond Good and Evil, Jack 2. The platform genre was in good health, with many innovative and groundbreaking titles coming out. And then, well, there's this. The queen of the last generation comes along, haggard and decrepit, peddling a style that everybody had moved along from. 
I'm not saying I don't like Tomb Raider's style of gameplay. I wouldn't be doing these videos if I didn't. But you have to move on at some point. You need to stick with the times. And when you combine such an outdated system with poor execution, you've got serious, serious issues. The game was just doomed right from the off. You can tell that Core could not handle it. They were simply not able to make it work. They tried their damnedest with the plot, but it couldn't hide the gameplay. Intriguing elements such as an occasional sidekick for Lara, Curtis Trent, eventually just got sidelined into a couple of levels when they'd planned so much more. They stuck all their eggs in the one basket at the beginning, and they never recovered. Oh yeah, and the PC port also glitches out and crashes frequently, and the PS2 version struggles to reach an even 30 frames most of the time. It's just such a dog of a game but not one that I take any pleasure in blasting. The reviews at the time were scathing as you'd expect, and sales were poor, a good first week before sinking like a stone as word of mouth spread. Paramount blamed Cradle of Life's disappointing box office receipts squarely on the failure of Angel of Darkness, which seems a trifle unfair to me. Jeremy Heath Smith, the wheel behind many of Core's titles, resigned from the company and ultimately left the game business altogether. Any thoughts of a trilogy using this game's engines? Well, they turned into dust. 2003 truly was Lara's Annus Horribilis. By the end of it, there was no film series, no comics, and possibly not even a game series. Because now, you know, the game did look like it was up. However, Eidos Interactive, publishers of the series since the beginning, weren't quite ready to put Lara out to pasture just yet. There were still avenues to be explored, tombs to be waded, and obviously money to be made. Still, the failure of Angel of Darkness meant that Core would have their own series taken away from them. They wouldn't get a chance to rectify their wands. Instead, Eidos gave the task of making a new Tomb Raider game to Crystal Dynamics, an American studio who'd previously hit big with the Legacy of Cain series of games. So when everything's seemingly in the gutter, it's time for a reboot. The resulting game, Tomb Raider Legend, would come out in 2006 with a new engine, new gameplay, new story and a new Lara. Everything had been redone from scratch. The Queen is dead, Len. Long live the Queen. Ten years had passed since the first Tomb Raider game and now everything that's old is new. And so, what would be the result? Well, that's what we'll be finding out in the next part. I know I said I was going to do Legend in the second vid, but it's way too long by now. So join us in part 3, where Crystal Dynamics take the helm. We start, of course, with Legend. We then pay tribute to the roots of the series with Tomb Raider Anniversary, before heading further into the dark and murky depths with Underworld, before finally reaching 2013, and, well, another bloody reboot. We started with a game called Tomb Raider, so it's only fitting that we end with a game called Tomb Raider. That's all to come, but for now it's time to end the video. Thanks for watching, and wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.